open your Bibles to 1 Kings 17. We're in the study of the life of Elijah on Sunday. And uh, we're about to close out verse uh, chapter 17. When uh, Elijah has left the brook of Ketret and has gone to the Phoenician, has gone to the uh, coast, the Mediterranean Sea coast, and has been sent to visit the widow of Zarephath, which is part of, is part of Sidon. That's kind of important, the whole lesson. Jesus refers it to the, where he visited the land of the Sidonians in Luke 4. Kind of, re kind of really important to chapter 18 and further. So we pick up, uh, he has entered the city. He has contacted the widow. She was out gathering sticks at the gate of the city. That was an easy contact, the way most of them are when the Lord plans it. And she has invited him to her home for the last meal that her and her son were going to eat and die because of the drought. And he said, no, that's not going to happen. If you share with me in your last meal... My God will supply all of your needs through this crisis. You need to really hear that. That drought was sent by God just as much as this virus was. You've got to understand that. Everybody wants to blame everybody, blame God, and then come to an awareness of why he did that. This drought was not manufactured by itself. God sent the drought, and this drought has affected the whole land. He's over in the Phoenician section of the land, and they're suffering the drought to such a degree that people were dying. She and her son were going to eat their last meal and die. He said, if you share that last meal with me, as God has requested, and she knew God had requested to feed the prophet from Israel, you, you will never miss a meal. All of your needs will be met, like, just like yours in Philippians 4.19. My God shall supply all of your needs according to the riches of his glory and grace. You need to understand that stuff. You pay too much attention to the, you t pay way too much attention to the drought and not enough to God. Your focus shouldn't be on this drought. It should be on God. I mean, where, where is Philippians 4.19 going to work in your life if it's not about God? And he, God has sent him all the way to the Phoenicians to a widow to declare to her the grace, the message, and the story of the grace of God. Well, she's in, she's, he, he has shared that last meal, and true to God's word, they have not missed a meal during the drought. And he has stand with her in the upper room of her place. Now it came about, verse 17, now it came about after these things, I just recapped, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, I explained that last week, the mistress of the house is a title in the religion of Baal. For witchcraft, it's the witchcraft of necromancy, being able to contact the dead. You can learn this, as I taught you last time, from 1 Samuel 28. You can't be lazy in the study of the Bible. If you want to know about that, you've got to go study chapter 28 of 1 Samuel. <clears throat> the same Hebrew word was used. Not the typical word for mistress. It's a, it's a title. Well, her son, the mistress of the house, became sick. And this sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. In other words, he died. Nishima Haim is gone. So she said to Elijah, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? In other words, 
She's blaming him. What do I have to do with you? You have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. She thinks, like in John 9, that the death of her son is to do to some sin in her life. John 9. I mean, you want, to re- you want the story behind the story, page 2 of Paul Harvey, you have to read a little Bible. You got to go to John 9. I'm not going to read it all for you, but that's where the background to it would be. And he said to her, give me your son. And so he's become an undertaker. He's become the undertaker. So he picks up a dead child and takes him to his upper room. Then he took him from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his own bed. He called out to the Lord and said, O Lord, my God, hast thou also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Well, here we go again. Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord. And I explained that last week to you. Why this three times and laying on top of the child and all that. His prayer is like so many Parents whose child is sick, listen, if there's any way you can transfer that to me, that would be fine with me. Because our reputation, me as a prophet and you as a God, I am the God of this prophet, I am the, I am the prophet of this almighty God, is at jeopardy. O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. Our reputation Mine as a prophet of the God Almighty, the sole God of the universe. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Isn't it good that the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers? Isn't it good the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers sometimes? And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child returned to him. The life of the child had been removed by God. And the life of the child has been restored by God. Let me tell you, when that child died, she was so far removed from the drought as an issue or a problem because the drought didn't kill her child, did it? He died with a full stomach. And boy, is God making a point. Listen, if you don't learn a God point, if you don't get a spiritual revelation, if you don't have a spiritual awakening in this virus crisis we're in, for your life, this is for naught. The drought did not kill her child. The one who sent it did. And to show a point, he raised him from the dead to make a point to the widow. That's the only person that's there. And she's the reason he was sent to Zarephath. Do you have those kind of experiences in your life where you wind up someplace you didn't expect to be, and all of a sudden, You ask God, why am I here? And he shows it to you, and it's your responsibility to grasp that moment for God. To grasp it for God. Not to grasp it for yourself and not for somebody else, but for God Almighty. Why am I here doing what I'm doing? What is the purpose in all of this? It is a God thing. Grasp the moment for God. He'll reveal so much in that moment to your life. I don't know. But the life of the child is back. Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see your son 
is alive. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God. That's like saying, listen, this is like saying, Now I know you're the man of the God. The God. She had a whole system of gods in her life. Due to paganism, worship, religion. And has come to a spiritual awakening that the God of Israel, the God of Elijah, is the God of gods. See, prior to that, she was just going to add him to her list of gods. Because she had found that the, that the God of Elijah had been faithful to feed her every day during the drought. And she goes like, wow, I think I will add his God to my list of gods. Because my God, Baal, couldn't do that. I was dying from the drought. Baal was the God of rain, and they're in a drought, and she's going to die from it. I'd be seriously thinking about him for a while. Now I know, now I know for certain, now I know absolutely truth. I know absolute truth that you are a man of the God and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth. It is true. What a wonderful spiritual awakening in her soul for salvation because that's why he, Elijah was sent to Zarephath, to find one widow who had positive listening God consciousness. And he, listen, and God intends to reach a whole nation through her. He intends to reach a whole nation through her, just like he did with Jonah, who went to the Ninevites. It's called foreign mission work. Let us pray. The uh, Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude types, sins of the tongue, overt sin types. How do we get out of carnality and spirituality, the indwelling ministry, the power of the Holy Spirit in the church age? Confess my sin, 1 John 1, 9. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me. And watch this word. Cleanse me. The work of Christ from the cross works two things. Works Adamic sin on the one side for the unbeliever. When you believe it, the blood of Christ saves you. On the other side, the Christian, the church age believer who has personal sin, when he confesses it, the blood of Christ works in his life to restore him to spirituality, not salvation, spirituality. That's a wonderful passage of Scripture, and people always are asking, why do you just use that one passage all the time? I do, personally, because of the word cleansing, which was used in verse 7 in 1 John 1. Well, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us by the Word of God on this Sunday. In the midst of a crisis, a crisis that's not only gripped our nation, but throughout the lands lands. And why would you do that, Father? Like you always do, a spiritual awakening. You did it in Egypt, a spiritual awakening, not only, not only for the Israelites, but for the Egyptians. Now, here we are in another occasion. You're doing the same thing. Will we never learn from biblical history any truth about you, Father? Here we are. It's become personal to us. It's on our doorstep. And the blood of Christ better be over that door and be important to the people inside it. And I'm not sure it is. There, I don't see a spiritual awakening to God. I see a rebellion against him. I see a resistance against you, Father. I see a preoccupation with a crisis and not with a solution, not dealing with the one who sent it. 
And for what reason? For sure, a spiritual awakening in every believer's soul and in the world of the unbelievers, it is a call to come to God through Christ for salvation. And who is going to bring that message? They've got to be Elijah's, willing to walk out of a, a crisis into a crisis for God. I pray somehow, Father, you would teach us these lessons through the life of Elijah that's on our doorstep. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we took a look at this whole thing. Um, I'm dealing with uh, this wonderful subject, if I can find my notes. Hey, Rhonda, run downstairs. Or back there. Is there, a, is there a lesson back there? I don't know what I did with mine. Oh, good. Thank you. I want to show you something out of Romans. I want you to go to Romans 14.9. I want to show you something that's really important to this story out of Romans. Romans. That's funny. I, before I left the house, I was studying that. I must have left that thing at the house. Who does that stuff? Anybody else other than me? Well, anyhow, Romans, I want you to take a look at something. I want you to look at Romans. If I can get Romans 14, 9. Watch this. This is important to our study because this is what God's going to show him. He's going to show uh, the widow. Uh, let's go back to verse 8, uh, maybe 7. For not one of us live for himself, and not one dies for himself. If we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Now watch the point, verse 9. It is for this end. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might, watch this now, that he might be Lord both of the living and the dead. No God, no God, no God can do that except Jehovah Yahweh. No God. And all of that ability of Lord over life and death was given to Jesus Christ by God the Father. And when did that occur? When Jesus was raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, that authority to be Lord over the living and the dead was ascribed to him. Let me show you another passage. John 5, and I'm just going to pull out a verse of it. I don't like doing that with you, but I'm into time. Jesus is talking about his equality with God in John 5. And he says in verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show, will he show him that you may marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, even so the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, in order that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father, who does... He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Let's go to Acts. I'm just making a case here. Let's go to Acts 10. Of 42. Acts 10, 42. This is Peter preaching. Want to go to verse 40 for just a little background, because in verse 39, he's been put to death by hanging on a cross. 
God raised him up on the third day and granted that he should become visible. That's post-resurrection appearances. Not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He's talking about post-resurrection appearances. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemn to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. This Lord that we serve, that was raised from the dead, ascended back to the Father, 40 days of post-resurrection, visible proof, is the Lord of the living and the dead. You must grasp that into your soul. If you have no other spiritual awakening during this crisis, get that one. He is the Lord God. He is the Lord God of the living and the dead in the church age. Now, if I could get you to believe that, we would be, we'd be a threat in the, in the devil's domain. Oh, I know you understand it scripturally. I'm talking about living it. The God, the Lord of the living as well as the dead. See, I know you have confidence if you die, you'll go to be with him. You don't have confidence that he's the God of life. And I'll tell you how you know is when a crisis comes your way, how you deal with it. And no crisis comes to the Christian life without God signing off on it. Please tell me you know that. And in your life, even though the crisis is great and affects people on all different ways, 1 Corinthians 10, 10 through 13 tell you that he never tests your life more than you have the capacity of the word of God in your soul to deal with it. If you're a baby, he deals with it on a baby level, immature on a mature level, mature level on a mature level. God is a wonderful... The Lord God sits at the right hand of God on the throne of authority today over life and death. And he, he, it is because he died on a cross and was raised from the dead ascended back to the Father and was seated and sent the church into the world to do his work called Pentecost. Wow, wow. Well, let's look at point one. When Elijah met the widow of Zarephath, she was picking up sticks to cook and eat her last meal with her only son and die. She was at the end of all hope of life because of the drought. My question, where was Baal's relief for the living during the drought? She's a worshiper of Baal. She's a witch of it. She, she promotes it. She believes that she has the power through Baal at his good pleasure, whenever he so desires it, that she can talk to the dead. First, First Samuel 28, the witch of Endor. She was the witch of Zarephath. She was the witch of the Sidonians. One of many. And her God is the God of rain, and they're in a drought. And he's proved that he's not the God of the living, that's for sure. And he never has had a reputation of being the God of the dead. And that's her dilemma. Where was Baal's relief for the living during the drought? The vaccine, the vaccine is not going to solve what God has sent. <laughs> Jeez. It's not going to solve it. Not in your life. Not going to solve it in your life, nor in any other Christian's life. And listen, it's been sent to the unbelieving world to bring a spiritual awakening. It will not work. This is about a spiritual awakening. 
I mean, I don't know how many times I have to show it to you from the Bible. Uh, one ought to be enough. But when it's not, it don't matter how many I give you. Elijah told her to share her last meal with him and that, that, and that his God would see to it that she never missed a meal during the drought. She gave testimony to it in verses 15 and 16 of the 17th chapter of 1 Kings. She gave testimony to it. Now he, the Lord grabs her again. He grabs her again. And listen, when God touches your life, it's always for positive. Even if, no, listen, how you see it is how you view it is a whole different ball game. And you need to see that when God touches your life with something that you call a crisis and the rest of the world calls a crisis, nobody doesn't think this isn't a crisis except for a guy like me. And I believe it's a crisis, but I think we have different opinions about it. I'm bringing mine from the Scripture. And where you're bringing yours, I hope it's not from facts because they're producing a lot of fear. They better come from faith. Better come from faith. She gives testimony that the God of Elijah is the God of the living. Her testimony is that the God of Elijah is true to his word. That he's a God of living. He can produce life out of death. Now she hasn't, it hasn't caught her attention yet because she's eating a meal and still alive. She was alive when Elijah came. She was ready to die. But now she has hope of life. But listen, God is the same God of life as he is of death. All things work together for good for God. You don't have a bad this and then a good this with God. They're all good. It's the way you view it. Oh, please, people. It's the way you view it. I have Christians tell me all the time, Oh, I said, well, read Romans 8, 28. They read it for God. He said, well, they say, well, I knew that. Then why are you acting like you are? You see, you, you, your head says, I believe Romans 8, 28, but your heart says, I don't believe it. Jeez. God brings us all, all these things in our life to bring a spiritual awakening, to bring us into the absolute truth. She says, I know an absolute truth that the God of Israel can sustain you in time of crisis. And I know Baal can't. That was awakening. Was that not an awakening? My, 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 that's an awakening. That was an absolute truth. And that's the beginning. Absolute truth. Where does absolute truth come from? It comes from the word of God or you don't get it. There's no, there's no absolute in the world apart from God. Jesus said, I am the truth, God. I am the way, God. I am the life, God. There's no truth, way, or life apart from God in this life or the next. Now, she's about to get another test from Elijah's God about absolute truth. She has found one about the living. Now she's going to learn something about the dead. For he's the Lord of the living and of the dead. You got to come to both these ends have to meet with God. The God of the living and the God of the dead is the same God. It is one God, and he's a mighty God. He's a mighty God in the living. He's a mighty God in the death. No, oh, I hope you know that. I know you know it, but is it an absolute truth that dictates the way you think and live your life? Absolute truth is the way it, it's not truth. Absolute truth is how it now becomes a thought of lifestyle and the way I deal with things in my life. Is that true in your life? Just when she was beginning to think that maybe she could add Elijah's God to her list of other gods, her son got sick and died in her arms with a full stomach and not from the drought. Now she wonders, 
What kind of a God would do this just when my hope for life, for me and my child, has come? I can understand that. And God has got to teach her another lesson. I'm not just the God of the living. I'm also the God of the dead. See, I think that in my church, you believe he's the God of the dead, but don't think he's the God of the living. Because this virus has been a big test in your life. It's not a Romans 8, 28. That's a toothache for you. I got a toothache. I can go get that fixed. All things work together for good. If it gets fixed. Romans 8, 28 applies when it knocks on your door. And let me tell you, He's knocks on, he knocks on your door a lot, doesn't he? <laughs> well, he's going to knock some more until he can knock some sense in you. He's going to knock some more. Oh, you need to listen to me today. I hope somebody, maybe on the Internet, maybe you're listening. Maybe you're listening. So point number two. God sent Elijah to the widow of Zarephath because, listen to me, circle the word because. You need to see that. Why is God doing this? Because. Why is God doing this? Because. Now, you've got to pay attention to because, because that's a life changer. The word because. God sent Elijah to the widow of Zarephath because he cares for her, her son, and her people's souls. Just like when he sent Jonah to the Ninevites. Just like when he sends you to the next door neighbor or somebody that's pumping gas and ask you for, hey, you, buddy, you, can you spare me a dollar? I said, listen, I can spare you more than that, buddy. A dollar will only get you down a road a short distance, but what I'm going to share with you today will get you all the way into eternity. See, I think that's an appointment. I'm going to give you more than you've asked for. That's grace. God sent him to the Sidonians. God sent him to the Sidonians, the heart of Baal worship, the heart. God sent Elijah into the heart of Baal worship and touched a woman's life who was a leader of the witchcraft to win the souls of the Sidonians. You think God ain't marvelous? Listen, you should grasp 2 Peter 3, 9 and apply it to your life when you go to the grocery store. Or have a call and, and they want to sell you something. I'll go for that if you let me sell you something. When somebody calls me up and go like, hey, you know, I've got the new gadget. And just for a few dollars, I'll listen to you if you'll listen to me. I don't think there are no coincidences. I don't live by fate. I live by faith. I don't think there's any accidents. I don't believe in accidents like that. I think if I can't go to him, then God sent him to me. And he don't even know it till I get through the conversation. Oh, you say, Rod, that's because you're a preacher. No, it isn't. I've done that all my life. I did that before I was a preacher. I did it. Listen, I did it because I'd been born to get it. I wanted everybody else to have the same experience. I wanted them to have the confidence that the Lord was the Lord of the living as well as the dead. I mean, can you imagine a person who can speak to people about the victorious life of living and the victorious life of dying, we're those people. We have the greatest message in the world, and it's, it's free or grace. 
my, my people. Second, second you, know, you know why God has sent Elijah to this one woman and passed up all the widows of, of Israel to go to that one widow? Because she had positive vision of God consciousness. God's obligated to give gospel hearing and see if positive vision will work. It did in verse 24. She found another absolute truth that she believed in, that he's the God of the, not only the living, but the dead. My, my. Second Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any perish, but all that come to repentance, a change of mind about the source of salvation. That's our mission, people. That's our mission. And no better time than a time of crisis. The other night, I sat in an ER room full of sick people. And I counted them. And I began to pray for each one of them. That this spiritual awakening time in their life would bring them to a realization that Jesus Christ is the Lord of the living as well as the dead. And every time I moved my seat, of course, you can't get near anybody. But I would move my seat around everywhere I could get and try to get a conversation going, even though we all wore masks. Now, let me tell you, I've been to the hospital a lot over my time. There's never been a time, except this crisis, that's how I know this is a big God deal when I haven't been able to have conversation with people about the Lord, especially in ERs or, or surgery rooms, waiting rooms. They're in a crisis in their life of some sort, and they're open for discussions as a rule. I, moved my, I was in the waiting room an hour before I could get back to the ER. There wasn't a room for my wife. She was in a hall. And so I had an hour out there, and I just kept picking the places till I went around to everybody. The last person to come in sat down with a mother, and the mother was holding this young person, and they were in a lot of trouble. And I walked over to them and said, you need prayer. And they both cried and said, yes, I do. And so I did something that I don't normally do. In an open setting, I knelt before them and had prayer so that everybody else could see the need for God in the ER room. Listen, I wasn't sent to the hospital because I needed ER. I was sent to the hospital because of my wife. I was in ER because God put me there. I normally am back there with my wife. As soon as she hits that door, I'm back there with her. Not this time. Oh, you say that's expected of you, Ron. You're a preacher. I'm telling you, I didn't do that because I was a preacher. I did that because I've been born again, and I believe my Lord is over the living and the dead. And I was dealing with some people that need it. And listen, you would have thought that maybe somebody would have said, would you, ha would you have prayer for me? Because when I've had prayer in, in, in the hospitals before with one person, I've had other people say, would you pray over me too? Not this time. You know what that shows? It shows you the fear of the virus. The fear of the virus. The fear of the virus. Luke 19.10, Jesus said, I have come into the world to seek, to save. Are you a seeker? Do you seek people? I didn't say see, I said seek. S-E-E-K. You put a K on the end of it. Are you a seeker? Do you seek out people? Do you wind up someplace and start looking around? Why did God put me here? 
They understood I was in the hospital, but I, well, why was I for an hour in the ER? A seeker. Jesus said, I came into the world to seek, to save those who are lost. Mark 8, 36, what is, he, what is he seeking in man? Man has a body, soul, and spirit. He's after his soul. Mark 8, 36, he's after his soul. It's not about your body. It's about your soul. It's never about your body. You're going to get a new one. Not about your body. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, as I sat there, I thought to myself, all my people need to be ambassadors for Christ. And listen, you become a real ambassador when you wind up someplace you're not supposed to be, and you ask yourself, why am I here? I can tell you why. You're an ambassador for Christ. Become a seeker at that point. And I had, I had positioned myself all the way around that place looking for somebody to talk to about Jesus Christ. I finally wound up back where I originally started from, and in comes a, a, a lady with, with a, a, a child, a young person, and sat down together, and they were in deep trouble, and I went, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I finally got somebody that really wants some help. You know why? Because I'm a seeker, not because I'm in the ministry, not because I'm a preacher, because I've been born again. Jesus was a seeker. I'm a seeker for those who need to be saved. And I don't have the gift of evangelist. I have the passion for it. I have the passion for it. Because I've been born again by it. <laughs> Just when she had renewed hope about life, her son gets sick and died. And the question is now, for what? From what? See, she thought. She had it all figured out. I know when we're going to die, and I know what we're going to die from. Boy, was she wrong. <laughs> oh, I know. We're, we're going to die from the drought. Boy, was she ever wrong. Just like you, are you ever wrong? You'll die because God pull, pulls your card, and it's your time, Ecclesiastes. Time to be born, to the time to die. And if you don't believe it, go to a cemetery and read. It always gives birth and death on a tombstone, right? Well, I'm just saying, most of them I've been to have. And so the question, died from what? From why? Died from what? From what? Sure wasn't, a, sure wasn't a drought. Then what reason? Well, it must have been, then it must be connected to the man Elijah. Right. If it's not the drought, then from what? Must be the man Elijah. He told me he, would, he served the God of the living. He proved that. But look, my child is dead. Dead from what? So she points to Elijah. Must be connected with Elijah. Said, you're right, give me your child. He goes upstairs and talks to the Lord about the child and why he'd been sent there to reach people's souls. And, he, and God reminds Elijah that I am, the, I am the Lord of the living and the dead. And he calls out to him to raise him from the dead and he raises him from the dead. That was a new experience for Elijah, just as it was for the widow. We have no record of Elijah ever doing that. And he didn't do it in the land of Israel. He did it in a foreign land that didn't have a Bible, that didn't believe in the God of the Bible, that didn't have any of that. See, I find that just amazing. If God, if God is not the most amazing God in the whole world, I don't know where you've been. That's amazing. And what do you have? Listen to me. Perfect timing in the plan of God. You know why? Because Elijah is a seeker. Something happens in his life. He goes like, whoa, 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 whoa. God's up to something here. He just stirred up my world, just like he did mine the other night. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
Perfect timing and the plan of God is why Elijah is there at this time with answers for her life. Oh, boy. Like Job, she wonders, if a man dies, will he live again? Job 14, 14. The thief wondered. The thief on the cross next to Jesus Christ wondered in Luke 23, 46. And Jesus was there to give him the answer. And I'm here to give it to you. You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, Adamic sins, that you don't have any, any power over changing. Thirteen judicial charges of Adamic sin are upon your life. Jesus Christ came to die on that cross to remove those 13 judicial charges. Alienated from God, blind, cursed, condemned, darkness, death, enmity, perishing. And you know the list. was buried on the third day, raised from the dead to give you life everlasting. <laughs> you know what's wonderful about the gospel? He's the Lord of the living and the dead. <laughs> spiritually dead. Physically alive and spiritually dead. And he, he enters your life and takes care of both of them because he's the Lord of the living and the Lord of the dead. Because he, 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 he won that award when he was raised from the dead and returned to the Father and seated at the right hand of God the Father. My, my, my. Jesus told, told the people, actually he told Martha at Lazarus' funeral when she was all upset, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, to have a resurrection, you've got to have a death. I am the resurrection and the life. That is life after death. I am life, I am life in life, and I am life after death. I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe that? Because eternal life, that's what eternal life is. It comes to you while you're alive and remains with you forever. In what we call death, you go from life to life. Through a door, an easy door, an easy swing open door, which we call physical death. And it, and listen, it is more, no more difficult for the believer to pass through that door than it will be for the rapture to come and you not go through the door. Now think about that. The only two ways you're going to get out of here is in church age. Either die or rapture. And the door swings easy for both of those occasions. Because of the work, personal work of Jesus Christ on your behalf for salvation. You know that? You say, yes, I know that, Ron. Then why aren't you sharing it? In a time of crisis, you should be sharing it. Write letters to people. Call them on the phone. Go internet. Go Facebook. There are so many ways to tell people the story of Jesus Christ today. Well, you're still wearing a mask. But are you doing it? You're wearing a mask, but are you telling the story? Why aren't you telling the story? That people are in crisis and need answers. This woman was in a deep crisis and need to have an answer. And God sent Elijah with answers. We're full of answers to a thousand questions. We've all got the answers. Why aren't we doing it? We're in a crisis. Everybody agrees with that, but they don't agree it's spiritual. But I'm telling you this. <laughs> Buddy, I'm telling you this. The widow was upset as a religious unbeliever, even though she believes she can sometimes con contact the dead as the witch. Does she believe that Baal, who could not provide for the living, could raise the dead? No, their religion never toted that idea. Another absolute truth. Satan must get permission from God before anyone could contact the dead. 
You need to read Job 1 and 2 and maybe read Luke 22, 31, 32 in case you think this was old and not new idea. Jesus says to Peter, Satan has been granted permission to sift you like wheat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She doesn't have the confidence of King David, a believer, who declared at his son's death, but now my child has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now listen to me at point four. God will do for this widow what he didn't do for David. He will return her son to her, but why? He didn't David, but he did her. I think you can best find the answer with Lazarus. Why Lazarus? Let me explain. Let me explain another spiritual, let me, an absolute truth that Jesus told his disciples about Lazarus. Now pay attention. This sickness is not to death. But when he got to the house of Mary and Martha, Lazarus was dead. And they were upset with Jesus that their brother died. He told his disciples in delaying his going to see Lazarus. And they questioned him because he could well be dead. He was on his deathbed. When he got the call, he said, we're going to wait. He said this. He told them, this sickness is not to death. You say to me, yeah, but, yes, Ron, but it was. Well, let's see what he's got to say before he jumped to conclusions but for the glory of God. This death of this child, of this widow, is going to be for the glory of God. So that the Son of Man may be glorified by it. Another absolute truth that he told Martha at the funeral of her brother. He said to Martha, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. That God is the Lord of the living and the dead. He's glorious in life. He's glorious in death. What a message the church has for the world. And let me tell you, there's a lot in the world that wants to hear it. Who will tell them? Somebody's got to tell them. What they're going to learn at the funeral of Lazarus is that God is the God of living and the dead. And they're going to learn that Jesus has that power. And listen to John eleven forty five. Why that whole? Why was that whole... See the glory of God. And why, what was the whole purpose of that whole exercise for Lazarus? Listen to 45. Therefore, the funeral of Lazarus. Jesus could have stopped that whole deal, but he didn't. He was after something else. Here it is. Verse 45. Therefore, many of the Jews who came to be with Mary, when they saw what Jesus had done, Believed in him. They saw the glory of God. They saw the Lord of the living and dead at work. Point number five in closing. First Kings 17. 23. That takes us to 24. 24. Elijah took the child and brought him up to the upper room into the house and gave him, 
into the, into the house that Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to the mother. And Elijah said, see, your son is alive. Here was the widow's testimony. You remember I said you don't have a testimony without a test. It's a test I moni of another absolute truth about God. Then the woman, do you notice she's not the widow and she's not the witch. She's a mother. Said to Elijah, now I know, that's the absolute truth, now I know that you are a man of God, of the God, and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is absolute truth. Verse 24. My question to us in the time of this crisis, both in America and all over the world, why should we share the gospel of grace salvation with others? And the answer is always a because. And the reason because is important this time, don't circle because, circle the word cause. It needs to be a cause. It needs to be a cause. That's why you have because. The Lord is not slow about his promises as some count slowness. But is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. If you can't get out in the community and you can't share it with the opportunities coming in your natural thing, you go to get medicine, you go to get groceries, you go to get gas, you go to this, go to that, then hit the Internet, write letters, talk to people who need Christ. Let me tell you, a crisis always brings it to a head. There needs to be a spiritual awakening first in us. This is not a time to shut down. This is a time to push forward as spiritual advancing believers. 2 Peter 3, 9. I give you a little home study. It'd be well worth your time, too. You ought to go back and see what Jesus said about this story and this widow. And you need to pay attention to some special phrases when you do. Like Jesus says, when he says, truly I say to you, your ears should perk up and you should really pay attention to what he's saying to you. And when he says, but I say, but I say to you in truth, your ears ought to perk up and you ought to pay attention to what he's saying. And you ought to pay attention to the great message that Jesus taught about how did this affect Elijah's life and how did it affect the widow's life? And how would they be changed forever? And you ought to remember the passage we started with. Romans 14, 9, To this end Christ died and lives again, that he might be both the Lord of the living and the Lord of the dead. That's the message we have to the world. It's my message I have to you on this Sunday. In the midst of a crisis, it's given us more opportunity and with more willing people to listen than you can possibly imagine. And we need to be on the front line, people. We are ambassadors for Christ. The crisis doesn't dictate it to us. We dictate it. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these who have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. May we become seekers to those who need to be saved. Bring a spiritual awakening in our souls. No matter which way our nation goes, we know what way we go. We follow the Lord, the living and the dead. The Lord of the living and the dead. Make us good ambassadors, not cowards. There are people all over the world who need to hear our message. Message of hope, not despair, not crushed, not perplexed, 
all of that out of 2 Corinthians. We are more than conquerors. More than conquerors through Jesus Christ. May we remember that, Father. May we share it with the world. In Jesus' name, amen.